They tried to stop my shine, but I said, hold up. Y'all know how many hoes done tried to hold this hoe up. Tokyo Talk boy. to music. Let's go. We got a special show. Let's go. We got a special show. How y'all doing? I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. It's your boy Craig. Craig's Pop Life Podcast. You know what it is. You know me. You know I've been writing about music for more than two decades. You can catch up on all my shit. Rnbeing.com. That's R. A N D being B E I N G dot com. You know what it is. Um, you may know me from my books, my Luther Vandross biography. Although apparently, some people on Twitter whose names won't be named, and I deleted all the tweets. But some people on Twitter want to act like I haven't been out here repping for Luther Vandross for like, you know, years upon years upon years. But that's a whole nother. Um, rant. But anyway, you know me from my Luther Vandross biography. You know me from my memoir, All I Could Bear, about me be- being a stripper hoe in grad school and how that helped me become a writer. And then you know my novel, Who's Your Daddy? Um, about three generations of gay men looking for that good old L-O-V-E. Or you can check out my forthcoming book, um, Hard at Work, fin- putting the finishing touches on that. That's special, a critical meditation on the life and artistry of Janet Jackson. What? Drops March 26th, um, but you can pre order the ebook now. Paperback available on the release day. All right, so now we're straight with that stuff, the intro. Now, I'll be honest with y'all, I had a whole other show planned, but you know, the world we're living in, Trump America, whatever, we're living in these breaking news times, and sometimes you just need to throw out what you had planned, and you know, something goes down, and you just need to change what you have to do. In this particular case, it's not like it's bad news, you know, I'm not, it's not, not breaking anything that's going wrong, it's just that, um, you know, with the quickness, uh, Solange just dropped her album. It is now 2.56. Solange dropped her at 2.56 a.m. Solange dropped her album at midnight. So that album is less than three hours old at this point. Um, the album is called When I Get Home. And um, did I say three hours old or three hours huh? I can't tell. Y'all, it's late. But I just felt like I just could not go to sleep. Um, watch my good How to Get Away to Murder finale and go to bed. Uh, watch Jesus and Moreau and go to bed. Like, I just felt like I couldn't do that without speaking on this new um, Solange effort. You know, I had to think back to what another wise person from Houston once said, Mr. Scarface. You know, it wouldn't have been right. It wouldn't have been love. It wouldn't have been life. It wouldn't have been us. And, you know, by us, I mean people that were so affected by her um, last album, A Seat at the Table, you know, because I guess, you know, for me as a um, as a person, as a critic in the industry and um, also as a big fan, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm already parched. Let me get some water. All right. You know, I think there's like two types of albums, okay? You have your game-changing albums, which literally, as the words, you know, game change is changing the game. The game is the industry. The game is the music game, you know, and you have those albums. And then you have those albums that I think of as life-changing albums that um, are much more personal. You know, they may not have the commercial impact that another type of album will have, but they do um, change and shape lives. And then sometimes you can have both. And I think with um, A Seat at the Table, we definitely got both. Because I think when you talk musically, you know, she helped bring in a whole wave of sort of intimate, introspective R&B singers, you know, not necessarily like she started them, but because of the way that she raised the platform and because of the way that she put the spotlight on that type of music, they were able to get a kind of different type of shine than they may have gotten prior to um, when A Seat at the Table dropped. So I'm talking about SZA. I'm talking about your Daniel Caesars. I'm talking about my girl Summer Walker. Still keep playing her song. The new Drake remix is hot. Down to your LMA. Not down to, but just over to your LMAs. Um, You know, and it goes on and on like that. So, and you know, so that's a game-changing album, right? But a life-changing album is one of those albums that I think touches you so deeply and really helps frame the way that you see the world. 
and I'm not being overly dramatic. I mean, truly, like, shapes the way that you see the world and you experience the world, whether it's, like, overtly in terms of it makes you think something or makes you think of things a certain way. Maybe it thinks, makes you think of love a certain way. Maybe it think, makes you think of your place in the world a certain way. Or just musically, like, the way it opens you up to certain sounds and maybe, you know, you are now open up to a whole new world of sounds that you would not have been open up to had you not experienced that album. That's what I call a life-changing album, and uh, Seat at the Table was definitely that, too, um, in major ways. You know, I think a Seat at the Table worked in that way, both because of the inherent artistic strength of the work, the, lyric, the lyricism, you know, the music and everything like that, but also just the timing, let's be frank, because that shit dropped two months before that damn election that fucking changed everything and fucked everything the fuck up. Am I right? You know, I know for me, days after the election, you know, I was just playing Solange repeatedly, just playing it, just playing it, just playing it, see the table. You know, I would sometimes I'd be like, you know, sitting back in my chair doing the grandma rock with my eyes closed, you know, just humming along to weary. And the other times I'd be, you know, angry as fuck. I'd be playing mad. I'd turn it up loud until my, you know, Cuban Trump support neighbor started knocking on the wall. And then I still wouldn't turn it down. You know, just times like that. So that really, I just, so I guess what I'm saying about that is like, just as that time in the country was something that I'll never forget in my lifetime, which I could, but can't. And, you know, that forever changed things. That album was right along with that time. So I don't see that as any different from the album. And I see that as, you know, really helping me. And, and it's not just me. I know a lot, so many other people that feel exactly that same way, which, like I said, is the reason why I cleared the schedule to um, talk about this new album by Solange, because Solange and the last album was just that significant to me and to um, so many people I know. I know about y'all now. I'm all off the notes. I don't even know where I am. But, um, so that's what happens when you're trying to break, break notes while you're listening to something. I've listened to it three continuous times. Now, so these are my notes. This is not just some little Twitter thing. Like I'm tweeting along, listening. No, 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 no. I listen three times straight. So make them my little notes and organize my little things on note cards as I want to do. So that is what this is. Um, and I know that, um, you know, another response, so I guess my feelings toward A Seat at the Table initially, those were kind of like, you know, that's how I was responding to it in my mind. You know, it's like I'm weary, I'm mad, and all those kind of things. But I know that at the same time, there was another thing that was going on in those dark days and something that's continued to that this day. And I think, um, I think the word retreat probably sums a lot of it up, but I know that in the days following the election and just see, you know, and all the stuff that came after it and just kind of seeing where people stood, you know, like maybe, oh, that person wrote that kind of Facebook post. Oh, that person liked that on Twitter. Ooh, he retweeted that. You know, I just felt like there was a complete refiguring of even my friendships and personal relationships, like people I thought maybe I was not necessarily all that close with, but maybe even being open to be close with or open to something. And then I see them like something and I, shit, you know, it's, the door is closed. You know, I became like that. I think I still am like that about, you know, where do you draw the line? Where do you stand? You need to stand for something if you, um, if I'm going to fuck with you at this point, because things, there's too much at stake. Do you know what I mean? So I think that there was that whole kind of reconfiguring um, that was going on and just kind of a real retreat, I feel, for me, just away from the mainstream, away from just status quo shit. Because, I mean, to me, the status quo just meant, you know, the motherfuckers that elected this asshole into the, you know, so like, fuck the status. Like, I didn't have time for that. I didn't have time for um, or anybody who even identified with the status quo and not even identify anybody who is even sympathetic to the mainstream or the status quo. I no longer had any fucking time for that. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's not just personally in terms of my personal relationship, but also professionally. Like, I'm, I'm not writing no bullshit now. Do you know what I mean? I'm not doing bullshit. I am only putting my talents forth, whether it's my, me running my mouth right now or whatever, book project or whatever. I'm only putting my talents forth in the service of something that I think is moving us ahead to the vision of the world that I want to see. And of course, I um, a lot of what I do is chronicle black culture. And so I 
live, I see a vision of a world that, you know, where black culture is even more centered. So that's where I'm putting my, my talents toward. I just don't have time for anything else. And that is something that happened during that time period. And like I said, that's a feeling that kind of um, endures today. And even just listening to um, the new album, When I Get Home, Solange's new album, a few times, I thought to myself, you know, she is summing up with this album that sort of feeling. You know, that feeling that I felt of retreating from the mainstream. You know, that feeling that I felt of like, I don't fucking care if you don't understand why I feel like where I feel like I'm not explaining shit to you. I I got to move. Like it's for me to have to explain shit to you. That's only slowing me down, and I don't have time to slow down right now. So fuck you if you don't understand what I'm talking about, and you don't understand what I mean, and if you're not, you know, with me. And I think that's just, I I know that's the way I feel. I know that's the way a lot of people um feel right now. So like I said, and the reason why I think it's the sound of that is that. It is really kind of um, a turn away from the sort of um, expository nature. And I don't say that in any way as a pejorative, a negative or anything. But just, you know, a seat at the table, you listen to it, and it really explains a lot of shit. You know what I mean? Like that is the function in a lot of ways of what that album does. That album is, okay, this is why we're mad. Okay, this is why we're weary. Um, This is why we don't want y'all to touch our motherfucking hair. Okay, this is why we can say nigga and y'all can't say nigga. You know what I mean? The album really breaks a lot of basic shit down. Whereas when I get home, it's kind of a complete turn for that from that. When I get home ain't explaining nothing to nobody. The meaning of when I get home is not through lyrical explanation, but it's all through the feel. And so that way I feel like this album and the message of this album is even more subversive because its meaning is not in words. It's not in explicit words. It's in codes. And these codes have to be fully experienced through the body. These codes have to be felt through the music that she's making. These codes have to be felt through listening to the way that she bends a word, the way that she repeats a phrase, what all of that means. That is where you find the meaning in this album. It's not through words. And what I love about it is that the music is like the album is a total vibe, like it's a real vibey album, but not in a kind of, a lot of times when we use that characterization, it's meant to sort of signify something that is meandering and sort of, and it's not like that at all. It's kind of like, you know, the African, the African-American tradition of repetition, but in the both the best way, whereas, you know, things are repeated, but with every re- reiteration, the phrase takes on more meaning with each re- with each repeating, it takes on a different meaning, and the album is very much grounded in that. Um, musically, what I love about it is that you know, it's not like it, there's a lot of instrumentation, but it's not like a jam album. It's not like you're lost in a thicket of like all sorts of instruments and somebody's jamming on it. It's not that at all. It's like she creates these lush sort of electronic soundscapes. And to me, it brings to mind, what it most brings to mind is like um, Stevie Wonder's work in the early 70s that he did using um, this, he even had a name for the computer, y'all. This synthesizer was named Tonto. It stands for something, I don't know, y'all can look it up. But anyway, um, that he made with that. And not even those albums specifically, but also the albums that he made using that technology for Sarita. I think they were married then, but they continued working together after they were married. Whatever. At whatever period they were in their relationship, he made two albums for her. The first album was just self-titled. It's called Sarita. And I think the second album was called Stevie Wonder Presents Sarita. But again, it's those same kind of richly textured electronic soundscapes um, that I think these very much bring to mind. And I also hear echoes of like Miles Davis's electronic period, um, things like my fave um, on the corner. You know, I hear a lot of that with like the rhythm starting and starts starting and stopping, and then just all of a sudden, you know, you hear the sound out the left side, and you know, if you're listening to to it on your headphones, you're like, what? You know, you look behind you like somebody's there or something. You know, it has those kind of unexpected sounds popping up um, here and there that gives me that kind of feel, and. You know, as she has done before, but I think it's even more 
sort of prominent this time because it's so musical driven. Just her harmonies are just, you know, that's a whole nother instrument that you have to deal with. You know, that's a whole nother thing that you're listening to and you're kind of like trying to make sensory meaning of because they're just so rich and so textured. I even this time I even hear like a little Janet, a little Janet um, multi harmonies in there. I mean, she just does it so well. And so, and there's one song called Ben's and I'm gonna be honest with you, you know, like I said, like I said, like I'm not explaining stuff in my career. I feel like that's the point Solange is. So I know there's a whole lot of Houston ass shit that I just don't get on the album and will never get. And I'm cool with that. But anyway, so there's one song called Ben's. Um, I'm not saying that's one of it. I'm just saying in general. I uh, just wanted to point that out. Features some of her most ambitious harmonies since, um, I don't know if y'all heard when she did the cover of the Dirty Projector, Stillness, of the, Stillness is the Move, but just, you know, just taking you all sorts of places and everything like that. She doesn't, her harmonies, they don't sound like this, but they give me the same kind of otherworldly effect as like the Sweet Inspirations you know, that had um, Whitney Houston's mama, Sissy, in it. Just where the harmonies, like, you just hear just different textures, and it's like you're whole, in a whole world of harmony. Like, the harmonies sort of all encompass you from all around. That's the kind of feel I get. Um, but again, not um, not the sound, but just sort of the, the feel. And overall, I mean, I just think that in a way, you know, I can see where she's come from because, you know, she got so much attention with the last album. She's so embraced with the art world, this and that, that there's so many audiences for Solange that are going to be kind of hype, paying hyper attention to her work, whether or not they are her ideal audience or not, you know, whether or not they know Deep Brandy album cuts, as, you know, she once put out there once, whether or not they know Deep Brandy album cuts or not, those people are going to be giving an ear to her album. So in a lot of ways, by not making it lyrically explicit, I don't mean explicit like, fuck y'all, I mean explicit like spelling it out, um, she's kind of giving them a harder time. Do you know what I mean? Like she's making it hard for them because they can't just look at a lyric sheet and pin her down. They can't um, do that. They have to either experience it or don't, but they can't reduce her to the level of some kind of clickbait. Oh, you know, Solange just said this or Solange said that. It has to be a deeper experience or you're not going to get it. And maybe you won't ever get it. Then you know it's not for you. And then what? You know, I kept thinking about, um, because the album sort of reminded me in a lot of ways of Erica Badu's Mama's Gun in the way that she kind of went from the very um, tight song structure of Baduism to Mama's Gun, which has a much more kind of organic, um, you know, kind of quirky feel. And I kept thinking that she, you know, was kind of rewriting a line from um, AD 2000, where she was going like, no, you won't be naming no think pieces after me. <laughs> you know what I mean? She will not just be pinned down like that. Like, either you're going to have to deal with her in the way that she presents herself in all of the obscure musical references that she wants you to experience, or you're just not going to um, get it. I mean, in a lot of ways, I was thinking of the lyrics that they're almost like as prompts as kind of that you can reinterpret or repurpose as needed. For example, like when she sings a one song, um, Call Me on the Way to the Show. Like I said, I've listened to the album three times, and each time I thought, well, what's the show? You know, like each time I thought the show could be something different. Like sometimes a show is just a show, you know, a show is just a concert or whatever. But I'm thinking the show could be anything. The show could be the revolution. You know, call me on the way to the show. What's the show? So it's that kind of, um, you know, it's that kind of ambiguity that gives the album such um, power and strength. And it's not really until the final song um, called I'm a Witness that I think she really makes her intentions clear because she says, you can work through me. You can say what you need in my mind. I'll be your vessel. I'll do it every time. So once again, Solange did it once again. Thank you, Solange. Once again, you have sort of um, made the music of the moment in such a way that it will go down in history in the same way that this moment, the significance of this moment, this historical moment, this cultural moment, this political moment, what have you, 
will go down in history. So I just think that thank you again for capturing a mood, for helping us think about our lives in a certain way through your music, um, for creating a vibe that I think makes us feel less alone, makes us feel less crazy because we know through the vibe, through the harmonies, through the music that somebody else is going through it too. Thank you for that. So, um, you know, so what can y'all do now? Y'all can just turn me the fuck off and just start um, streaming Solange because it really is an important album. And I would say, you know, if you don't get it the first time, listen to it the second time. If you don't get it the second time, listen to it the third time. If you don't get it the third time, have yourself a drink. I don't know if you do smoke weed or whatever. Maybe that's the answer. But it's like I would say stay with it until your um, the emotional vibration that you're putting out or the mood that you're in at that time kind of reaches um, what she's going, what she's kind of giving out, the vibration she's giving out with the album because it's definitely worth the patience and it's worth the work in order to um, – Get to you know another thing that the album reminds me of. Now I'm all messing up my ending, but the other thing the album reminds me of too, and transition, I would say it's very similar to the transition from D'Angelo's Brown Sugar to Voodoo. You know, again from something that's very song structured to something that's much more, much harder to pin down, but in a lot of ways just richer and wilder and just. Um, has so much resonance that lingers. So anyway, like I said, turn me off because I haven't got anything to say but what I already said. And um, I love you all again for listening. Um, you can catch me next week with a more, um, you know, where I'll get back to all the TV. Because I've been watching a lot of TV, y'all. Y'all been watching Umbrella Academy? I've been watching a lot of TV. So um, I have a lot of TV to speak on um, come next week. And so until then, be cool, be kind, be creative, and in the words of my fave, that did not work. I, again, that did not work. One day I'm going to get this shit right, y'all. Okay, so here we go. Take motherfucking two. Shit. It's fucking 3.16 in the morning. Shit fucking up. But anyway, um, until then, be cool, be kind, be creative, and in the words of my fave, be your damn self. <laughs> Be your damn self. (laughs) (laughs) Now I can't stop it. All right, y'all. Love you. See you next week. Take care. Bye.